Alright, so I'm just going to start reading. Lamps line the drive. Their low, undulating light gives the entire area an ethereal glow. Every window is dressed with red and blue sashes. Lights hang along the covered parapet walks, and the ramparts are decorated with ga gonfalons displaying the royal crest. The body of a lion with the talon of an eagle and the head of a hawk. The golden mantling is set against a crimson background with the royal motto emblazoned across the bottom, A Dio Rex, A Rege Lex, which my father told me means from God the King, from the King Law. <laughs> the palace guards, dressed in colors matching the crest, line the length of the footpath just outside the main entryway, their gleaming swords holstered at their sides. Their face is stoic and unchanging. A wave of panic washes over me. I dread going inside. <laughs> the queue of carriages extends behind us almost all the way out to the main road. We inch along, waiting for our turn to exit. This is more than I ever than I could have ever imagined, Aaron says, staring up at the castle. That something could look so beautiful and still be a nightmare is terrifying, I say as I look at her. You don't know that will be a nightmare. I wasn't talking about the palace. She shoots me a frustrated glance as she climbs out of the carriage. I follow her, my heart galloping in my chest, my nerves getting the better of me with each passing moment. There are sideways glances, hushed whispers, and more than one catty laugh. I've never felt so exposed. I look through the crowd, and for every judgmental face, I see another is drawn tight with fear and apprehension. <laughs> I struggle to keep my balance atop my heels as I approach the guard and hand him my invitation. My finger is trembling. He checks it and crosses my name off the list. Aaron does the same and we push through the crowd of young women that has flooded into the main sentry hall of the palace. Gilded cherubs line the walls on either side of the long hallway. A portrait of Cinderella hangs over a set of enormous double doors overlaid with gold lilies and the royal family crest. In the painting, she is seated with her hands de delicately clasped in her lap. She looks serene, smiling gently. Her golden hair falls around her shoulders in tight ringlets. Wearing her iconic blue dress, she gazes at us, her shining hazel eyes reflecting in the candlelight. She is watching us. A pair of guards pull open the gold-framed double doors at the end of the long entryway. The rush of girls spills into the grand ballroom, but Aaron stays by my side even though the tension between us remains. The ballroom is as large as a field. Dozens of crystal chandeliers hang over the space, their light washing us in a warm glow. I can see my reflection in the ice-like surface of the polished marble floor. I smell the fresh-cut flowers. The smell of fresh-cut flowers permeates the room. An entire orchestra sits readying their instruments, and random notes float through the air as they prepare to play. I can hear Aaron sucking in quick gulps of air behind me. I want to comfort her even though she's all but ripped my heart out. Try to take a deep breath, I say, quickly ga glancing at her. She nods, slows her breathing, and readjusts her wig. The girls break off into groups, and I scan the room for Liv, but can't find her among the sea of ruffled dresses. I hope she's been able to get to the palace on time. More girls than I was anticipating crowd the room, and each of them seems to be stunned by her lavish surroundings. Just then, I am struck hard on the shoulder by someone walking past. I turn to see a girl glaring at me. I don't recognize her, and I think for a moment that she's looking past me at someone else. Who do you think you are, wearing a dress like that? She hisses. Excuse me? I ask, bewildered at the hate dripping from her voice. Cinderella's dress? More like a cheap knockoff. You look ridiculous, but you probably couldn't afford anything better, she says. Her breath shallow and eyes wide. Fear lingers just below the surface. Sorry, give me a second. Sorry. <laughs> Do I know you? I'm growing angrier by the second. She rolls her eyes. No, but that's because I don't run in the same circles as peasants trying to steal the spotlight from the rest of us. Pathetic. I figured there would be men who might have something rude to say, and that I would be required to keep my retorts to myself. I didn't think that the harshest words would come from another girl. Sophia, says Erin as she takes hold of my arm. She doesn't know what she's saying. 
Yes, she does, I say, shrugging off Aaron's hand and squaring up with the other girl. Does it make you feel better about yourself to put me down? Her face flushes crimson. Don't be ridiculous. You're no competition. Then why say anything at all? I walked towards her and looked at her dead in the eye. You're just as afraid as the rest of us, so don't take it out on me. I know I will be chosen, she says, her voice trembling. That's exactly my point. Do you even know what that will mean for you? My parents aren't stupid. They've made sure I'll come out ahead. She's implying that her parents either paid money to have her picked by someone specific, or that a suitor has already purchased a claim on her. Do you think your money makes a difference? She glares at me. I would expect someone like you to say money doesn't matter. Erin tugs at my arm again. Money won't keep your, your husband from using you as he sees fit, and your privilege won't keep you safe. You and I are exactly the same in the, in the eyes of the king and the suitors. Her face pales a little. Regardless of her abrasive front, we share the same fears. A small crowd has gathered around us, a mixture of alarm, hope, and uncertainty all in their faces. A trumpet blares. Everyone looks around, unsure of where to go or what to do as a throng of guards marches in, their boots pounding on the floor, sending a shudder through the entire room. They push the girls into a line, positioning them so they all face in front face the front of the room where a three-tiered platform stands, the king's empty throne at the very top. It's a massive seat made of gold, inlaid with rubies. A giant lion's head is carved into the backrest, its mane designed to give its occupant the appearance of having a golden halo. A squat guard takes Aaron by the shoulder and shoves her into the line. I stop between I step between them and push the man's arm down. Don't touch her. Sophia, Aaron says, her eyes pleading, don't. Listen to your friend, little girl, the guard says. A man nearly a foot shorter than me has the nerve to call me little. He grabs me roughly by the elbow, shoving me into the line next to Aaron. I yank my arm out of his grip and scowl at him. He smells of sweat and cigar smoke. Feisty now, aren't we? He smiles, exposing every one of his yellow and rotting teeth. Gross. Leave me alone, I say. The man raises his eyebrow and the corner of his mouth turns up. He grabs my arm again arm again, this time digging the tips of his finger into my skin. If I act quickly, I can break his nose and run away before he has a chance to catch me. I ball up my fist and draw my arm back. The trumpets sound again and he hesitates for a moment before letting go of me and walking away in a huff. I push away the tears, refusing to let them fall. The, at the atmosphere changes as the guards direct a line of girls across the grand ballroom. A palpable sense of fear descends as those who were excited to arrive soon realize that this is no happy social gathering. It isn't, it isn't even a well-disguised trap. Erin stands silently, a big smile plastered across her face, her hands shaking. I purse my lips. I have to get us out of here. My arm throbs in time with my frantic heartbeats. Glancing around at the other girls, I finally spot Liv. She wears a plain cotton frock, no makeup other than a bit of rouge on the apples of her cheeks. Her hair is draped over her shoulder and a crown of baby breath encircles her head. She stares at the floor, and I watch her chest rise and fall in the rhythm of someone who is quickly losing her ability to pretend that everything is fine. She looks lovely, but as she glances up, I see only sadness in her eyes. She shakes her head, and I know that something has gone wrong. She hadn't been visited by a family gar godmother, and her parents couldn't afford to make other arrangements. Her gaze moves down the length of my gown and back up again. She smiles and presses her hand against her chest. I swallow hard. I know what Liv will be facing if she isn't selected, and my heart aches for her. The king might grant her a pass to work in Hanover, or maybe even Cheon. But that isn't a solution as much as a punishment. The people there run workhouses where forfeits labor day and night with a small amount of com compensation sent directly to their heads of household. I desperately try to find what Luke had called an out, but I can't think of a single thing that doesn't end up with us in prison, or worse. A guard stands at attention and clears his throat as a set of doors at the side of the room open and the procession of men file in. His Majesty's honored guests, he announces. The suitors. The Marquise of Eastern Lily, the guard says. The Marquise mar marches in. She's always dressed in audacious. He always dresses audaciously and makes a point of showing off whenever he can. But he has outdone himself this night. His suit is the color of fleshly 
Marigolds fleshly. This suit is the color of freshly bloomed marigolds and is so tight it looks like it's been painted on. The fabric creeps into all his creases and I can see the I can see outlines of things that make me wish I could poke my eyes out. In the brim of his three pointed hat is a plume of brightly colored feathers. His shoes are made from some kind of animal skin but have been dyed yellow to match his suit. He climbs to the tier just below the throne and stands there like a very awkward bird. The Marquis of Eastern Lily is the highest ranking man in Marsalis, besides, the, besides King Manfort himself. The Earls of Hanover and Killspire and the Viscount of Chion, says the guard. These men in their entourages are less officious than the Marquis, but they still think themselves better than the rest of us. They are smiling, some of them laughing, and all of them dressed in their finest attire. They walk in and take their place on the second level of the three-tier platform. The barons, the guard says, his enthusiasm waning, and penis and peasantry, he says, that last part like a curse. The last of the suitors file in. Some of them are old enough to be my grandfather, but that doesn't stop them from shamelessly ogling the young girls. I cross my arm as one man looks at me from his perch, I, and I stare at him unflinchingly. He only smiles wider. Most of them are well-to-do men, not quite commoners, not quite aristocracy, aristocracy, who stand on the bottom of the the bottom tier of the platform. Their attitudes are more reserved, but they are here, so they can't be that concerned with the well-beings of the girls present. Some of them admire us, while others look around the grand hall as if they, too, are in awe of the lavish surroundings. It's hard to believe that the king found so many like-minded men within riding distance of a lily, and it doesn't surprise me that even men considered peasants by the palace are positioned above all the girls here. Surely there are good men among the ones gathered here, but if there are, they won't stand up to be stand up to be counted. The men on the bottom tier seem restless, wringing their hands or tapping their shiny boots on the marble. One man stands quite still, gazing out into the crowd. I know him. Luke. Chapter 9 I clear my throat loudly and he looks in my direction. He catches sight of me and smile. I smile back, but I am immediately struck by a sickening sense of apprehension. He said he could avoid the ball for as long as he wanted. So why is he here? Had he lied to me? And if so, had he lied about other things? I've been more open with him than I should have and now I regret it. He continues to stare at me and I clench my fists at my sides. I swallow hard and kick myself for being so trusting. Now I'm worried he'll tell, but my temper, my fear, by temper, my fear, he holds, he's told things about, ugh, he told me things about himself too, his gaze widens to the upper part, of, his gaze wanders to the upper part of the wall, and I follow it, portraits of the king of Marsalis hung, hang around the ballroom, some of them are as wide as the barn door, Prince Charming's portrait hangs by the tiered, platform. His hair is gray and his skin is creased around the corners of his eye and mouth. A fur is draped around his shoulders. He lived to be almost 100 and was Miss Sally's founder. Paintings of his successor are hung up as well. King Eusis, King Stephon, and of course, King Manford. Since the time of Cinderella, the throne has been passed to his successor of the king's choosing. All new kings are handpicked from a city beyond the forbidden lands that does nothing but work to produce a suitable heir. The city's name and exact location are a closely guarded secret because the rulers of Missalis fear someone might interfere in their process of always putting the most detestable fools on the throne. <laughs> on the throne. Cinderella hadn't had any children, and her Prince Charming had ruled alone for nearly 75 years, dying a decrepit old man and passing the throne to his successor, King Eustace. Three notes from the trumpeteers blast through the room, and the guards scramble to form two parallel lines near the door. Every one turns as the royal anthem blares, and King Manford appears in the doorway. He strides in, draped in a blood-red fur cape and all black underneath. He proceeds to the platform, ascending the steps as three servants follow him up. Each of the men already standing there bow low, and when he gets to the top, Manfred unclaps his collar and 
tosses the cape to the servants, who gather it up and scurry away. There is an audible intake of breath from the crowd as the music fades. He stands in front of his throne, and I get a good look at him. The last time I saw him in the flesh was at his coronation. I had only gotten a glance of at him then, but from very far away. But I see him now clearly. He has dark wavy hair that curls up just above his ears. His eyes are dark and his skin is, skin is a warm golden brown. He is tall and commanding is, and absolutely possessed of self-importance. Some of the other girls in line seem completely smitten, even before he's had a chance to speak. They stare up at him, their mouths open, smiling as if he and his predecessors aren't the sole reason most of their parents have gone bankrupt from funding their trip to the palace. I am honored to have you here tonight, says the king in a booming, gray, gravelly voice that echoes off the walls. The girls beside me sigh, trying her best to catch his attention by batting her eyes repeatedly and poking out her chest. She raises her hand slightly to wave at the king, but she inadvertently attracts the gaze of another on a lower platform, a stocky little man who fur furiously tabs his forehead with a piece of cloth, throws the kiss at her. She quickly lowers her hand and looks down to the floor. The men you see before you are some of the most upstanding members of our, of our community, said the king. I doubt that very much, I say under my breath. They have journeyed from near and far to see what the young ladies of Lily have to offer, and I must admit, gather around here tonight are some of the loveliest faces I have ever seen, except you. The king narrows his eyes and raises a long slender finger, pointing it directly at someone. Anger flashes across his face, and for a moment he appears gaunt, pained. I blink several times and look to the girls on either side of me. Surely they see it too, but their expression remains unchanged. You there, step forward. A guard passes behind our line and pushes one of the girls forward. She stumbles into the open space at the bottom of the platform. Liv. Your, your majesty, she sputters. She curtsies and then stands, wrapping her arms tightly around her waist. Aaron's breathing becomes frantic, and I take half a step forward. I see so many beautiful gowns, beautiful faces, and then I see you. The king glares at her. Were you not aware that this is a formal event? The men on the platform laugh, and so do many of the other girls. Luke is silent, staring ahead. My heart races as I take another step forward. The, the king's lip curls into a hideous smile. My, my. My, my parents, they couldn't afford Liz starts. Excuses are for the weak, the king says. The ball was obviously not a priority. He takes stock of her again, his face twisting into a mask of disgust. Do your parents care, care that now, looking as you do, will not be picked by one of these fine gentlemen? Liv sobs. I'm sorry, your highness. I hope the fairy cough mother would see fit to visit me. The king descends the steps to stand in front of her. Just behind my shoulder, a hulking guard looms over me. Get back in your place, he says, just above a whisper. I hesitate. He doesn't look at me as he speaks and seems much more concerned with what the king is doing. I slowly step back in line. You are indeed sorry, says the king. You didn't earn a visit from the fairy godmother. Did you, didn't you consult the book? Didn't you do as Cinderella would have done? His tone is taunting, sarcastic, cruel. No one makes a sound. Even the men on the platform quiet themselves. I did, your highness, Liv said. Her voice choked with what I can only imagine is some combination of fear and dread. I study the book every day. I have worked with my finger to the bone in service to my father, to my king. And here you are, says King Manfred, disgracing us both. He walks around Liv like an animal circling, circling its prey. My stomach turns over. He touches the fabric of her dress, running his hand over the seams of her sleeve. He stands in front of her again. Did you make this dress yourself, or did you find it in the gutter somewhere? Nervous lap laughter erupts from the men on the platform. None of the girls laughed this time. It could have easily been any of one of us standing up there. I made it, said Liv. I, I didn't have a choice. There are always choices. They may not be the ones you like, but there are always choices. You could have worked harder, couldn't you? Your parents could have sold something. You could have gone out to work in Hanover. They are always on the lookout for talented young women like yourself. Girls who'd voluntarily go 
to Hanover instead of attending the second or third ball must get a pass from the king himself, and many of them never return. Alas, the king sighs. You chose to wear this abomination to my ball. A terrible choice, but... He leans in so his face is almost, almost touching lives. Now that I look a bit closer, I can see that you are quite lovely. He reaches out to pull, a, pull her hair through his fingers, sighs, and gazes past her. While your beauty surpasses some of the other faces here, I simply cannot allow you to come dressed like that. What will people say? They'll think I've lowered my standards, and that, my dear, simply will not do. The king nods to a nearby guard, who steps forward and loops an arm under Liv. Wait, she screams as the guard drags her towards the side door. Please, I'm sorry. The king claps his hand twice as he ascends to his throne. A barrage of men in white coats and matching dukes lanches come in, pushing carts with silver platters piled high with succulent hors d'oeuvres. The band starts to play a chipper melody. Let the festivities begin, says the king. The crowd disperses as the men descend from their platform to mingle with the girls. I'm frozen. I can't breathe. I pull out the corset, but it won't budge. Looking from across the room, I gauge the distance to the door to see if I can make a run for it. But there are too many guards. I watch the king surveying the room as he sits atop his golden chair. He runs his long, thin fingers over his chin. Suddenly he stands and his servants scramble behind him as he descends the platform and disappears through the door where the guards had taken Liv. I grab Aaron by the wrist and duck away, weaving through the crowd until we end up beside an elaborately decorated table with a gleaming glass bowl filled to the top with blood-red liquid. What will they do with her? Aaron asks. I don't know. I don't know where they took her. I look toward the door again. They probably put her out. Oh, Sophia, this is terrible. What will she do now? This is already her second ball. I don't know who's actually gone to a third. She'll be forfeit. Don't say that. Maybe we could find a way to get her to her and then leave. We can't. They haven't even started the selection ceremony yet, Heron dabs at her eyes. No, I mean, I want to leave Lily. I want to leave Marsalis. I want to get as far away from here as possible. We have to run. Fear envelops me as I take Aaron by the arm. Shh! Aaron looks around to see if anyone heard me. You can't say things like that. People are listening. I don't care. A few people glance in my direction. I lean in toward Aaron. We have to get out here. I can't leave, she says through grid teeth and a fake smile. My parents have invested so much, and so have yours. They can't see keep us safe. Look around you, Aaron. Who are our parents to do anything? They won't defy the king, and I don't care what they've invested. Without warning, a hand grasps my shoulder, and I return, expecting to see some bumbling idiot ready to make a claim on me. Sorry, says Luke with his hands up. I didn't mean to startle you. I exhale slowly, relieved, but then remember his words from the other day. Were you lying to me? You said you didn't plan on coming here. No, I knew you'd be here and I wanted to see you. Sophia? Aaron watches us. Luke with the eyes of a hawk. Miss Aaron? Luke gives a little bow. Do we know each other? Aaron asks, an edge of anger in her voice. Yes, well, no. I mean to say th is that you know my sister, Mila. Your sister? I wasn't aware the Langley's ever had a son. A uh, surprise? Luke spreads out his fingers and shakes his hand awkwardly. He turns to me. I knew you'd be here, and I was worried. You were worried about me? I asked, a little surprised. We'd only just met, and while our conversation had been intense, I didn't expect him to feel any obligation to me. What did you plan to do once you found me? I was going to choose you, if that's all right, I mean. What? Aaron asks, taking the word right out of my mouth. Her entire demeanor changes. Her body goes rich as she looked back and forth between Luke and me. You want us to be together? I ask, utterly confused. I thought if you and I could be matched, you'd be spared from having to be with one of those dolts. It would be a ruse, of course, but it could buy us some time. He is willing to pretend in a way that might benefit us both. A glimmer of hope brings to life inside me. This could work. Nothing has changed. I meant every word I said to you the other day, he lowers his voice. We could get out of here, and then we could make a plan to leave Lily for good. Aaron makes a noise like she's choked on a bit of food. Her jaw is set, her eyes narrow. You'll never make it past the towers. 
We can try, I say, echoing what I told her in the carriage. We have to try. We have to do something. Come with us. She can come with us, right? I look at Luke. I don't know how, but I'm sure we can think of something. I can see he isn't at all convinced of that. I don't want to go with you, Aaron says angrily. Go get yourself killed if that's what you want. But I'm staying here and doing what my parents and the king expect me to do. Aaron, please, I... Of the crowd appears a young man, about the same age as Luke, who wedges himself between us. You look absolutely ravishing, he says to me, taking my hand and kissing it roughly. He winks at Aaron. And you're quite pretty, too. I think this may be my lucky night. Give me a second. I, I'm doing that to see if I can cut it out later. I really need to get Sorry, if I'm going to be talking, you probably couldn't hear me. If I'm going to be talking for another hour. I need to drink. Okay. Okay, let's continue. My dad's being loud, I need to close the door again. And uh, hopefully without any further interruptions now. The man moves his lips down onto the inside of my forearm. I snatch my arm away and move to Luke's side. Excuse you, I say sharply, but I'm spoken for. Saying no isn't good enough, but you might respect another man's claim on me. The young man looks at me and then at Luke. I peer around him and catch the sight of the back of Aaron's head as she disappears in the crowd. Luke Langley, the man says. Edward, says the man's name as if it leaves a foul taste in his mouth. I I hear you've had a run-in with my brother, Edward says. From behind him steps a bruised and gaffed tooth Morris. Shit, Luke says. Morris frowns. I bet he thinks his name is shit, I say to Luke. It's the first thing you say whenever you see him. <laughs> Luke bites back a smile. What did you say? Morris asks. He seems dumbstruck that I can form actual words. Oh, don't worry, I say. The name suits you. Just embrace it. Morris is furious, but Edward seems amused. Settle down, Morris. He looks to Luke. I must admit, I'm surprised you're here. After all, none of the prospects are boys. I'm not, and I'm not surprised to see you here, Luke says. And seeking more than one girl? That seems about right. Luke squares his shoulders and leads towards Edward. Seems like you've come into your own, Luke. Where's that scared, pathetic little outcast I used to know? Edward lurches at Luke, forcing him back a step. Ah, there he is. Edward laughs and then reaches out, slipping his hand under my chin. I move to bat him away, but Luke beats me to it. He catches Edward by the wrist, wrenching his arm down. I grab a small cup from the table to my left, dip it in the punch bowl, and toss the drink at Edward. The red liquid cascades down the side of his ivory jacket. Edward's face twists into a mask of rage as he looks at his ruined clothes. Luke puts his arm under mine and we rush off, leaving Edward in a sputtering, hissing fit. I frantically search for Aaron as we cut through the heart of the crowd and end up on the opposite side near the powder room entrance. I catch a glimpse of her just as a band strikes up a waltz and the young women pair off with different men. Everyone moves in a dizzying circle in time with the music, and I lose sight of her again. My heartbeat pounds my ears as I lean down and put my hands on my knees. How did one family end up with two complete fools in the same generation? They gave from their father, says Luke. He gave up their mother as forfeit when we were in school so he could take a new wife. 
He was cruel for, to her, and still Morris and Edward want nothing than to be exactly like him. Their family has gained favor with the palace. They support everything the king does, without question. Why? I ask. Morris and Edward's family have ties to outside tra traders and cities beyond the forbidden lands in the west. They support the king, sharing their profits, and in return the king lets them do whatever they want. Sometimes they invite envoys to bring their goods to trade them, and then rob them on the way into Marsalis. How do you know all of this? I ask. It seems like something you'd want to keep a secret. It's Morris. He loves to talk about his special privileges and thinks that he'll never have to face any quan consequences. Consequences. He's probably right. Luke puts out a hand and I take it. He pulls me into the swirling mass of couples and we spin to the tune of the waltz. I glance towards the king's throne. It's still empty. We need to get as far away from here as possible, I say. Exactly. Luke lifts his arm and I duck under it, stepping back to take his hand again. And how do we get past the watchtowers? Even if we're married, the king would never allow us to just walk away. I think we could sneak out. We could find a way. I'm sure of it. I remember how the guards had called for the executioner when a runner had tried to cross the border. I've never heard of anyone leaving without the king's consent. Neither have I, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. We've also... We have also rarely heard about people like us, and yet here we are. Just because they deny us doesn't mean we cease to exist. It's entirely possible that someone has attempted an escape in the palace has had hushed it up. But could someone actually escape? Has anyone ever actually done it? That would be a secret worth keeping. I think of the circle of blackened grass at the fountain. Maybe there is something to what Luke is saying. The border is guarded all the way around Lily, I say. Luke lowers his mouth to my ear, less so on the western edge. No, I say, the western edge of the city butts up to the white wood. And we can't go through there. It's too dangerous. No one is stupid enough, stupid enough to actually try and escape that way. We shouldn't go through there, Luke says. But we can. We have to decide if we're willing to take that risk. The alternative is staying here, falling in line, being at the mercy of the king and his rules. It's not a way to live. I'm willing to risk leaving by any path necessary. I need a minute, my, I say. My head is spinning. We're going to do this. We're going to make our escape. Luke gestures to the powder room door and I nod. When you come back, I'll let the registrar know that I'm going to make a claim on you. He shakes his head. I'm so sorry that I have to say it that way and I'm sorry that you can't be with Aaron. I smile at him and he kisses me gently on the cheek before I duck off. The powder room was bigger than some of the houses in town. In the center sits a circular sofa covered in fabric decorated with pink roses. It smells of lavender and fresh flowers and girls are lounging about, talking among themselves. No one has ever looked- no one has even looked at me, one girl says. Is it my dress? My hair? I did everything my father told me to do. You look gorgeous, says her friend, glancing at her shyly. They clasp hands and go out, arm in arm. I go to the mirror and stare at my reflection. I will allow Luke to choose me, and together we'll find a way out of the kingdom. I'll convince Aaron to come with me, and we'll have to find live first. But what about the others? All the girls left behind will be at the mercy of the king and his deplorable cohorts. My painted face stares back at me like a stranger. I dip my hands in the basin and splash myself with water. The rouge runs down my cheeks in thin rivulets, and I pull my hair out of its coils, letting it fall around my face. Other girls come into the room and look at me as if I lost my mind. A loud bang, like someone dropped a sack. A stack of plates comes from the ballroom. Shouts ring out as the other girls scurry from the crowd, and I follow behind them. A crowd gathers in the ballroom, all pressed together, staring at some commotion. As I push through the crowd, I glance toward the door where they take and live. The door stands open. Through the force of people, I see the king walking briskly from the room, and I, ca and I catch a glimpse of an old woman with hair as red, white as snow being propped up by a palace guard. The door closes, and I move to the front of the crowd to see what the commotion is about. Two guards stand holding another man between them. He struggles against them, and the guard dub on the left delivers a swift punch to the man's ribs. He doubles over. I feel like I'm going to be sick. Luke. 
Edward in a stained jacket, his brother Morris at his side, stands in front of Luke. This man thinks he can make a mockery of this time-honored tradition, and I will not stand for it. The king appears at the other side of the crowd, flanked by his guards. He smiles as he watches the scuffle, and I am taken aback by how happy he looks. His eyes seem lighter than they had when he was perched atop his throne. His face seems less stern, and his entire demeanor has changed. Luke knows full well that my brother intended to claim. He searches the crowd until his gaze lands on me. Her. I stifle the urge to vomit. Morris grins, and I think back to what could have made him assume I was remotely interested. He doesn't even know my name, but I realize that it's less to do with me and more to do with making a fool of Luke. The rules are clear, Edward continues. Morris comes from a family of higher class, better breeding, and so Luke's claim is void. But I admire his efforts, truly. Luke slips the guard's grip and lands a clean jab on Edward's chin, sending him stumbling back. Edward rushes in, face, fist, his fist raised. I scream out in terror, and the king snaps up. King's The king's head snaps up. He looks directly at me. Enough, orders the king. Edward stops in his track, lowering his hands. The king signals his guards, and they scoop Luke up and drag him through the same door where they take and live. As the crowd disperses, some of the guards laugh with Edward and Morris. My heart sinks. Luke was my only chance to get out of here, but beyond that... Now I'm worried something terrible is going to happen to him. Scanning the room for Aaron, I don't see her, but the suitors are watching me. I hear some of them whispering, stumbling over my own feet as the crowd presses in. I catch sight of Edward whispering, some, whispering something to Morris, who then makes his way straight towards me. Hello again, he says. I'm very sorry you had to see that. The air whistles in and out between his broken teeth as he lies to my face. I think you and I should get to know each other a little better now that I've made my intentions clear. He runs the tips of his fingers over the exposed skin of my shoulders. Where have they taken Luke? I ask. I'll ask you because I'm a gentleman and not to not to <sighs> not to mention his name, says Morris, pressing in on me. But I'm sure he'll be dealt with in whatever manner the king feels is appropriate. Tears well up. He made no mention of the claim. You were lying. Morris frowns. Don't tell me you were actually happy about Luke's claim on you. I was. He sighs heavily and takes my hand in his, squeezing it tight. Do not embarrass me in front of all these people. I'll need you to smile, and even if you're not happy, you'll need to act the part. He leans in and presses his lips close, lips to mine. I try to pull away, but he holds me close. He smells like wine and sweat, and all I want to do is get away from him. I step back and bring my knee up as hard as I can, right between his legs. His blunted yelp make the people around us stop and stare. The look on Morris's face switches from anger to bewilderment, and finally agony. Before he has a chance to recover from the shock, I duck off and run to the empty powder room. I slam the door closed and frantically look, <coughs> look for an exit. The only door is the one I just came through. And there's only one narrow window. No closet, no wardrobe, nowhere I can hide. My heart crashes inside my chest. I glance at the window again. I reach under my skirts and whip and rip off the farthingale, unhooking it and laying it fall down around my ankles. I strip off the underlayer of petticoats, leaving just the shell of the dress. Reaching behind me, I struggle to untie the knot at the back of the course. Corset. I can't manage it. After kicking off my shoes, I push open the small window and hoist myself up. I'm halfway through when someone grabs a hold of my ankle. <laughs> Sorry, water break. We've got a runner, the guard yells. Oh, chapter 11. We've got a runner, the guard yells. Images of the women they caught on the border flash in my head. I bring my leg up and kick the guard as hard as I can, breaking his grasp. I pull myself the rest of the way through, tumbling down onto the roof of another structure just under the window. The air is chilly, and I can see it out over the rear of the castle grounds. The wind catches the hem of my gown and whips it around my ankles. I struggle to keep myself upright as I inch along the roof. The guard yells, trying to come out the window after me, but he can't fit. I keep moving and glance over the edge. The ground isn't too far. I can make it if I jump. I gather myself and prepare to leave. leap when the roof I'm balancing on gives way with a sickening crack. Grasping at air, I fall, landing on my back. 
the Beth, the, the Beth, Beth, yeah, Beth. <laughs> the breath punched out of me. I rolled onto my side, heaving, pain spiraling down my leg. I scramble to my feet and look around. Cold and dark, the narrow passageway smells of dust and stale water. It's unlit except for the moonlight that shines through a row of small windows at the top of the outer wall and through the hole in the ceiling that I'd fallen through. Several doors line the interior wall, all of them bolted from the outside with big brass locks. The sound of water dripping echoes through the co down the corridor and music from the great hall wafts in like whisper. I walk along the cramped hall, looking back, half expecting the palace guards to come barreling in at any moment. When I come to the end of the hall, a door juts out from the exterior wall. This has to be a way out. A way out. As I turn the handle, I hear a faint sound, so faint I almost lose it in the distant melodies of the band's waltz. I stop to listen. The sound comes again. It could only have been emanating from the door opposite me. I press my ear against the wooden slats. A faint flickering light comes from the crack near the floor. Someone stops quietly behind the locked and bolted door. Hello? I call out. The sobbing stops and I hear a rustling noise. I press my ear against the door. Ear harder against the door. Hello? I call again. There's a small shift at the door as if someone's leaning against it from the inside. Hello? A voice says just above a whisper. Is someone there? I look down the corridor, afraid of losing my opportunity to escape. Yes, I'm here. Why are you here? What an odd question coming from someone behind a locked door. There's a ball, I say. The crying resumes. Who are you? Why are you locked up? Run away. Don't ever come back. Save yourself. Where has she gone? A man's voice cuts through the darkness and echoes down the corridor. A shriek escapes my throat. I bolt out the door in the exterior wall across the man manicured grounds until I find cover in the wooded tree line. Crouching low, I peer out to see lamps moving around like fireflies in the distance. I want to find Luke, Liv, Liv and Aaron, but I can't go back. If the king's men apprehend me, they will execute me. I turn and run straight into the woods. Stumbling over the thick underbrush and exposed tree roots, I'm sure I'm heading the right way. Okay. And exposed tree roots. I'm sure I'm heading away from the palace because the trees become thicker and the darkness becomes more complete. But I have no idea if I'm on course to the main road or just walking in a circle. The canopy blots out what little moonlight is still visible in the night sky. The voice from behind the door sticks in my mind. I'm ashamed for leaving whoever she was there, but I need to focus on escaping. I push forward for what feels like hours. The cold is biting, and the sting of it on my arms and my stocking feet leaves me numb. I haven't come across a road or a trail or any of the fencing that runs along the outer edge of the palace grounds. The estate is fast, and I fear that I may be too lost to find my way out. What have I caught myself into? My teeth chatter together, and I shake uncontrollably, struggling to see in the dark. I notice that the trees are beginning to thin. I hope it's the forest edge, but it is only a clearing. On the other side are more trees and more darkness. I step into the open space where a large rectangular structure stands. As tall as my own house and nearly as wide, the structure shimmers in the silvers of the in, in the slivers of silver moonlight, charcoal gray veins run through the white marble walls. As my eyes adjust, I realize that the that it is the, 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 the. I'm doing much worse than last time. I realize that it is a mausoleum, and the name carved in flowing script on its edifice is as familiar to me as my own. Cinderella. Another quick water break. Okay. Ivy creeps up the entire facade, covering the structure in a tangle of tendrils. The surrounding grass stands as tall as my knees, and all of it is dead and brown. The tomb looms in the dark, and as I stand before it, in the dead of night, breaking the king's rules for the upteenth time, I feel like I'm seeing something not meant for anyone to see. This place isn't supposed to exist. I wade through the brush and come 
to three wide marble steps lean, uh, leading up to the doors of the mausoleum. Bushels of faded, crumbling flowers clutter the stairs. Small toys and hundreds of folded pieces of paper in varying stages of decay litter the monument. Some of them are only yellow to bear at the edges, while others are nothing more than little piles of dust. I pick one up that looks sturdy enough to handle. Unfolding it, I read the words scribbled inside. Please allow my daughter to be chosen. Please make her stand out amongst the others. Picking up one note after the other, I read as many as I can find that are still legible. Please help us find a way to pay for her gown. Meet me at the palace where the man took our sister on the last day of the growing season. Bring only what you can carry. They are all essentially the same. Please for help or good luck Please for help or good fortune, for luck or for protection. The last one sounds like someone was trying to plan an escape. Clearly, whoever it was meant for never got it because it's rotting here in the shadow of Cinderella's tomb. They were more than trinkets, as my mother's helpers had said. They were petitions, prayers. Looking up at the tomb, I wonder if Cinderella has heard their cries, or if she even cares at all. More likely, she is laughing at how miserably we failed to live up to her expectations. I climb the stairs to the pair of double doors guarding the entrance. Etched into the stained glass of the door panels is a depiction of Cinderella's carriage drawn by four white horses. A flicker of light shines through the glass, glass doors, and I freeze. A blue, white, a white blue flash illuminates the inner sanctum of the mausoleum and lingers for a moment before dying out again. I try to see through the colored glass, but only a faint glow towards the rear of the chamber remains. I should be running home. I need to get away from here before the guards find me and drag me back to the palace. A branch breaks in the distance. Someone is out there. Taking my chances with the flickering light, I push the doors open and go inside, closing them behind me. I don't hear anything, but I stay still, holding my breath. Directly in front of me, Cinderella lies on a slab in the middle of the crypt. I jump back, my heart thuttering in my chest. Two hundred years in the crypt should have rendered her body dust and bones. I squint in the shadow and see that the figure on the slab is only a marble rendering of Cinderella. Sighing heavily, I lean against the inner wall of the tomb. At the end of Cinderella's story, she and Prince Charming embrace... They kiss, and she goes off to live a life of luxury in the palace. It doesn't say anything about how she hid in the castle, castle while her people suffered. The prolonged, the prolonged illness that took her life, or why she now lies in an abandoned tomb in the middle of the woods. The walls of the tomb extend high above my head. Frigid, musty air fills the space, and I rub my arms, trying to warm my freezing limbs. I walk along the inside wall. My mom's calling for me. What? Uh, yeah. I'm still recording. Mm -hmm. Last time I was alone in the house. Uh, this is what we'll have to do. I walk along the inside wall, studying the lifelike carving of Cinderella. The sculpture looks a lot like the portraits I've seen of her. She lies on her back, her hands clasped over her chest, holding a bouquet of marble flowers. The rectangular box that extends down to the floor is also made of gleaming white marble. That strange light flickers again in the rear of the crypt, lighting up the darkness in short bursts. In an alcove, a small square glass housing sits atop a pedestal with metal trim wrapped around it like a cage. The panes of glass, the panes of the glass box are foggy, and broken leaves clutter the space. I clear away the debris and clean a spot on the glass where my, f with my fingers, so I can see inside. The white blue glow lights up the box. A pair of shoes, small and almost completely translucent rest inside. These are the fabled glass slippers. I guess the legends were true, I say aloud. Not entirely. I spin around, knocking my knee against the pedestal's base. A figure appears in the crypt. The person wears a large, a long cloak with a hood covering her face. I didn't mean any harm, I swear, I say, clutching my knee. 
The figure is silent. Have they come to take me back to the palace? I scramble to think of what to do. Cinderella is dead, says the figure, the voice light, airy. I doubt she'll mind you lurking around her tomb. Sorry, water break. I'm not lurking, I say, searching for something with an arm's length that I can use as a weapon. And if you lay a hand on me, lay a hand on you, I wouldn't dare. The person reaches up and pulls their hood back. A shock of lush, reddish curls frames her face, their face. It's a young woman. She tilts her head to the side, looking me over. Not unless you want me. Not unless you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, flirting. Sorry, she's flirting. <laughs> Look, I'm a lesbian and I like this part. Not unless you wanted me to. I am struck silent. You're, you're not working for the king then? I'm having trouble figuring out who she is and why she's here. I would choose death over serving him. Her tone is suddenly serious. I keep Cinderella's sarcophagus between us as I move towards the door. I was just leaving. And where are you off to? She asks. In your hand, she holds a small lantern, lit just barely enough so I can see her face. We are matched in height and build and are probably close in age as well. Her fawn skin, dewy and smooth, seems to glow from within. A ripple of guilt runs through me. I should not be admiring some stranger's beauty at a time like this. I'm trying to get home. On a night like this, a pretty girl like yourself should be at the palace looking for a suitor. She watches me carefully as she speaks. I've just come from there, I say. The way she said the word pretty gave me gives me pause. It's a compliment, but there's is something else in her voice. I avoid her eyes. I'm not going back. I don't care how many guards the king sends after me. Don't you want to find a husband and settle into your proper role? Subtly isn't this girl's... Subtle... Sub... Sub... Isn't this girl's strong point? Sarcasm permeates every word. I don't want anything to do with a husband or any sort of proper role. And why is that? She asks. Because that's not my choice. That's not what I want. It's probably a mistake to spill my secrets to her, but I feel like I have less to less and I have less and less to lose with each passing moment. She smiles at me and my face flushes hot. So did you come here to pay homage to Cinderella? She asks. She places her lamp on the ground and pulls a small bundle of flowers from the folds of her cloak. I shivers as she walks up to place them on Cinderella's coffin running her hand over the smooth marble. No, I say curtly, but from the looks of it, lots of other people have. And I didn't think this place still existed. My teeth cling together as I try to bite back the cold. She walks towards me, takes her cloak off, and places it around my shoulder. Better? Yes, thank you. I almost swoon in the warmth of the cloak. I breathe in her scent, a mix of wildflowers and lavender. I have to remind myself to focus. She's wearing a pair of close-fitting trousers and a tunic. A thick belt encircles her waist and from it hangs a gleaming dagger. She goes to the doors and peers out through a little chip in the glass. Her face relaxes as she turns to me. Why are you dressed like that? I asked. She looks lovely, but I've never seen a woman wear pants and a tunic before. The pockets, she says. She puts her hand in them and gives a little twirl. I love pockets. I smile despite the cold, despite the terrible circumstance. You said before that I was wrong about the legends being true. What do you mean? Her gaze drifts to the glass slippers. All fairy tales have some grain of truth. Picking apart that truth from the lies can be tricky, though. Questioning the stories against the law. She stiffens. I'm sorry, I'm not threatening you, I say quickly. It's just that I've rarely heard anyone say that even parts of the story are fiction. <clears throat> Most people believe every word, and you don't? I don't know what to believe anymore. The weight of everything that has happened falls on me at once. I have to go. If the guards find me, they won't if you stay here, she, uh, she says. How do you know that? I ask frantically. A wave of panic rushes over me. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now, but I have to do something. The girl stares at me for a moment. West of the city center, about five miles, the road branches out into two fo forks. The far right one meanders for a few more miles and leads to a gate. Meet me there tomorrow. I probably won't be alive tomorrow, I say. I'll be rying in some dungeon on the king's orders by then. Her brows knit together as if 
This troubles her. She ducks behind the coffin and picks up a small bag. After fishing around inside, she picks out a set of clothes, a pair of pants and another tunic, a pair of boots, and tosses them to me. Put these on. I set her cloak aside and pull on the trouser trousers. Casting aside the shell of my dress, I slip the tunic over my head and the girl steps towards me, a small drag dagger glinting in the lantern light. My heart skips. I realize what a fool I've been to so blindly trust a stranger. I turn to one, one, one. I turn to run, but in one quick motion, she slices the string of my corset, and the first, and for the first time all day, I can breathe. My heart pounds in fear, but also something else. Exhilaration? Panic? It feels like I'm free from something more than fabric and strings. Stay here, she says as I face her. Stay hidden, and tomorrow, come to meet me, if you can. Because I think you're probably right about the king's men. They won't stop searching for you, she strains up. What's your name? Sophia, I say. I'm Constance, she says. I'll lead the guards away from you. When you leave at first light, stay off the main road. I don't even know which way to go, I say, feeling more hopeless with each passing moment. City center is a direction in the direction of, re of the rising sun, she says. Remember, leave at first light. She moves to the door, and I hold out her cloak. Keep it, she says. You can give it back when you come see me. Okay, I'll read chapter 15 tomorrow.